Good afternoon. It is 2 p.m. Saturday, June the 20th, uh, 2020. I'm Leon Davis, and welcome to Altitude Adjustment, the podcast, the weekly podcast covering people, politics, and professions. And uh, back with me again this week, a couple of really great fellows, uh, Warren and Leonard, my brother Leonard. Um, and we're going to be talking about um, interest. We're going to be talking about borrowing money and how that impacts life and to try to make some rational sense out of um, why you should or should not borrow. Welcome to Altitude, Altitude. 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 Adjustment. Adjustment. Okay, so I got a little turned around this morning and all of the pictures weren't as they should have been, but they should be now. Welcome, gentlemen, and thank you for joining me this week. Thank you for having me. Likewise. Very good. So, um, for me, so I'll I'll start. Um, My first introduction to uh, mortgage loan, mortgage lending to loans was in the early, in the middle 80s, about 85, 86, maybe. And I worked for Citigroup. And Citigroup at the time, I don't know if they still do, but Citigroup at the time was a big mortgage initiator. They initiated loans and then they sold them on the secondary market. And my responsibility was answering phone calls and helping people pay their mortgage if they had uh, questions about uh, their payments and things like that. And part of my responsibility was I had to understand what a amortization schedule is. Now, I've never bought a home myself, uh, but I know both of you have. And so you've gone through the whole process of, um, you know, down payments and points mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff and, and dealing with amortization schedules. Um, so, f- So first, before I move on, just kind of give me a little bit of what you think uh, about, you know, when you think of a mortgage lending. Okay, well, then I'll, I'll start. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe I asked too general I mean, a question. <laughs> it, it, yeah, I mean, it is what it is. I mean, I don't know many people that can actually pay cash for a house. So, uh, people in my circle that do the traditional go out and get a mortgage deal, you know? Right. And then, you know, so you go get this mortgage because nine times out of 10, you're not going to run across somebody that can pay for it. You have to judge your credit worthiness to pay this note back over 15, 20, 30 years. Very Uh, good. And then when you pay it back according to their amortization schedule, Mm -hmm. it takes you 30 years to pay it off and you've been paid over three times the asking price of the house that you was originally purchasing. And I asked them one time, why why you got to do this? Oh, we have to do this because if we just charge you simple interest and you pay it back, we'd have to charge you another two or three times. So in other words, we have to take your money. Yeah, that's what it is. Good. I'm glad you, you uh, want the house. You give up the money. <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up. Um, I, I, so, so to, to share with people what my experience was, and I agree with you, it is what it is. Um, if you want to buy a house, They've, they've rigged the system. I don't want to say rigged, um, that, that they have, um, set the system up so that rather than just pay on a monthly basis, you know, rather than get a home, pay on a monthly basis to pay off of it. Um, the, the lender wants their money back immediately. So, Mm -hmm. so you, then have to take out a loan and then you pay interest. And Leonard, you did you mentioned that you pay more than what the original loan was for the house. So in the background, you'll see an amortization schedule. And I'm going to quickly go through 
Um, and, and I know this interest rate that I'm going to use is not indicative of what currently is the case. But in 85, mm -hmm. this was, um, uh, you know, normal for uh, a loan. And mm -hmm. um, so 10 uh, percent, I think it loans ranged around 10 to 12 percent. So this is a we're going to uh, this amortization schedule will work for, you know, auto loans, um, student loans. I think what else was in there? Uh, car personal loans and stone payday loans. So anyway, you can you can go to the uh, the website uh, amortization calc.com and get an idea of what your monthly payments are going to be and um, um, how much you're going to pay over the life of the loan and how much you you know it's going to cost you to borrow that money. So the, the amortization schedule that I first saw. saw was a $200,000 loan, okay? It was a 10%, it was a 30 year fixed at 10%. And if we click on the calculator there, okay. What year was that? This was about 85, 86. Mm, okay. okay. Okay, 85, 86. We bought our house, first house around 85, actually. Okay. So your monthly payments are going to be $1,755 a month. This is for your house. Okay. okay. Um, the initial principal on the loan was $200,000. It's a $200,000 loan. Okay. And you're going to pay back over that 30 years, you're going to pay back $600,000. And thirty one thousand eight hundred and fifty two dollars. Now, hmm. the the and and the way that they they set set loan structure up is that the first you're going to pay your first few mortgage payments or your first I don't know ten twenty years. The majority of your seventeen hundred and fifty-five dollar a month payment goes to interest. Correct. It doesn't go to the principal because if you, if it, if it, most of it went to principal, then they wouldn't get as much interest over mm -hmm. the life of the loan. And what a lot of people were doing, where they were getting, they were getting a loan. And then sending additional money towards principal mm -hmm. so that they wouldn't wind up having to pay as much in interest. Right. And so what did loan companies do? You remember what they what? did? Did they a uh, few penalties for prepayment early. penalties for paying that off early. For paying that off the early. Or they restricted and said you could not pay the loan off early. Mm-hmm. OK, and, and so when we look at um, when we look at society and we look at, you know, the cost of living. And you think about it, um, you're buying a piece of property. You go out, you work hard to make your money. And the, the borrower gets twice as much for your property as you do. So you've got a $200,000 house. You've paid $600,000 for that house, not $200,000. Right. You've paid $600,000 for your house. And if the market just stays the same, You could sell your house for about two hundred thousand dollars, maybe two hundred and twenty thousand dollars. Right, right. But the average person buying is expecting some reasonable grain gain. Now it's not guaranteed, but uh, depending, especially over a thirty year period, you should have a really decent gain, uh, gain unless the neighborhood went south. <laughs> which, and that can which has happen. happened. 
Yeah, which is yeah, happening. Yeah, it happens. You know, so I and 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 I understand that um, home ownership is a desired thing. I have every intention, or I had every intention to buy to buy a house, to buy a home. Mm-hmm. It's just my situation never uh, structured out that way. Um, and I wanted to build. I didn't want to, to which is why I, I waited so long, um, mm-hmm. is that I wanted to build. I didn't want to buy a home that someone else had created. I mean, if I was going to spend that kind of money, right? I wanted something that that was specifically designed for me. Um, and, and I was trying to save towards it so that I would not have to have that large, you know, uh, borrow a large amount of money. But I did understand that borrowing was a part of how home ownership, um, unless, you've got, <laughs> unless you've got wealthy uh, family members that are, you know, going to spot you uh, a couple of hundred thousand dollars to get your home. I wish. <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, so, so, so there is this big outlay and, and it, the reason I was so adamant about, you know, getting us uh, so much money was because once I looked at that amortization schedule and I looked back and I was thinking, I'm going to pay back over three times the value. Mm-hmm. of what I originally borrowed for my for my ability to live in this home. And um, my family is a financially oriented family. My Both of my parents were in accounting. My sister is in accounting. My mm-hmm. brother um, was uh, went to school for uh, um, economics. economics. So, so numbers was was how we operated. We okay. we saw everything in dollars and cents. You know, I I know I've got to live someplace. I, I'd love, to, you know, to have a house, but I saw it as dollars and cents. And then when I I'm looking at it, and I'm going, you know, I'm I'm paying back six hundred thousand dollars. You know, there's no way for me to get that back. There's no way that my house is going to appreciate enough. It is going to appreciate, hopefully. But there's there's no way it's going to appreciate four hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, that's a, that's a really inflated figure there when you look at uh, price for what you. Um, you know, actual actual equity. You know mm-hmm. what you pay in the long run, and you know it's it's crazy. Okay, I agree. Now you mentioned to me earlier when we were talking about this that um, there are no ten percent interest loans anymore. Well, uh, I was talking about the current finance rates for homes. Uh, Now, I'm not saying that that doesn't exist. I'm saying uh, the baseline or the average rates are are very low. Now, if a person has some uh, extreme credit issues, there is no telling what they might have to pay. I I can't read. I don't know those numbers. And I want to put a pin in that um, and come back to that the, the interest rates are charged based on credit worthiness. I want to come back to that. I want to address that also. Right. Um, so give me a, a percentage rate of in a in a in our current market that's reasonable. Four percent. Four percent. I've seen. I've seen uh, interest rates go as low as three point two three. Mm-hmm. Uh, four five. You're paying ten percent these days if you're considered uncredit worthy. So it could be ten point five seven five percent, that kind of thing. Mm, okay. So if we go with four, that that would be a safe assumption for yeah. That's little- pretty much what he said was right on the money. A year ago, 
when we got this house a little over a year ago, it was four. We just refied for 3.5. So Leonard was pretty much right on the money. Oh, excellent. Okay. But that's with good credit. We have good credit. So person with not so great credit, I don't know how much higher they would pay, but you know, we got decent credit, so we're blessed to be able to get that rate, you know. Sure. I get you. So I, pu I plugged in a uh, $200,000 loan, mm -hmm. um, and, and that seems to be kind of close to the median house. Mm. Yeah. They're and all the running, word. you know, close to that. 30-year mm -hmm. um, fix. Um, I, I looked at an arm loan. I, I wouldn't get close to an arm loan. Um, I wouldn't get within three states of an arm, arm loan. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, you can get God. Huh? You can get God on them. Oh, man, can you get burned on an arm? But, I mean, they're out there, you know, for people who who are willing to roll the dice. Um, right. mm -hmm. So so I plugged in 4%, so we've got a, a $200,000 loan, uh, a 30-year fixed at 4%. $200,000, you're still going to pay back $343,000. That's a hundred and that's a hundred and fifty thousand, almost one hundred and fifty thousand dollars more than what you borrowed. Yeah. <laughs> now, I, I I'm not saying this. I, I I don't. I'm not picking on this because I want anybody to feel that they made bad decisions. Right. Right. As 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 my uh, co-host have pointed out this is what it is this is <laughs> this is how the system has been set up yeah and and if you want to have some level of comfort in your life this is where we are i'm hoping mm -hmm. that by starting the conversation that that we can get enough people to say hey let's look at this why does this make yeah. sense? Huh? Well, it's like the casinos. They set it up where the house always wins. <laughs> so you're caught in it. If you want this money, uh -huh. this is what you got to do. This is the industry. That's a good one. Huh? The house. And the house always wins. Yeah. Uh, no pun intended. <laughs> but also, you have you're talking about government and regulators. Who the government siding with? Okay, you do a vote. And on a typical election cycle, it's every four years, you might get 20, maybe on a high year, 30, 35% of the people to vote. In the meantime, all those mortgage industry people is putting that large money in those regulators' pockets. Oh, Who do you think they're going to go for? So the chances mm -hmm. of getting that to change are remote. The mortgage industry is not going to change that themselves. No, they're making too much money. Absolutely. All the money they're making, so they're not going to cut their own throat, so to speak. So you have... You are stuck. As well, a consumer, you're stuck. Right. Unless you get rich and can buy it out of pocket, you're stuck. And so, and so, I I understand. Um. What about? I mean, what's what's wrong with paying on a monthly basis, paying for a house? Nothing's wrong with paying for it on a monthly basis. I mean, let's just face it. If you take credit away altogether, our economy would die. Why would it die? It would come to a screeching halt, Why? our economy. Why? Because the transactions wouldn't happen. A lot of people, for example, a car, they wouldn't go get a car. Why? Now the car loan, the car loan is taking you seven years to pay off for a vehicle. Right. That, I mean, that depreciates in value, goes down in value. So right, you, you drive, drive a car. Lot. You drive a car off a lot, drive it around a block, and bring it back. You can't get what you just paid for. 
it automatically yeah. takes about a 25% hit in depreciation. Yeah. If you if you cut out these loans, people a lot of people that don't have that money could pay over time, but don't have it right now. It would stop this economy. I mean, business transactions, a lot of them just would not happen. Okay. Uh, and here's and here's here's the question I have about that. If I have a monthly income, I have a piece of property. Mm -hmm. I own a piece of property and I rent it. I don't have to, or, or I have a, a, a house that I want to sell. Mm -hmm. And you give me, uh, so I'm asking, you know, $800 a month or, you know, I'm, the $200,000 for the house. Okay. And you're going to make it and make the payments in monthly installments. Why mm -hmm. is that not doable? Why is that not doable that you pay me on a monthly basis for that house? Well, because that seller wants cash. He wants that lump sum. He why? doesn't want it. That's what I'm saying. Why, why do I force you into a loan where you're going mm -hmm. to pay back three times the value of the property? Because Leonard says, so, so we've said... I, I, I agree. We set up our current economic system so that credit is the default transaction mm -hmm. of large purchases. Yeah. So I'm well, examining. Seller, go ahead. Seller's not in control of uh, the financing. He just he just wants his payment for the for the property, and uh, you know, however you come up with the money is is going to satisfy him. He 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 doesn't say. You have to take a 30 year loan out. He doesn't set the rates. He has nothing to do with that. He just wants his value for the property. And that's what the loan industry is requiring. Uh, that on a 30 year loan, we're going to make the first 12 or 13 years. The mm -hmm. payments are anywhere from 80 to 95 percent interest right because we again in america in our culture we place a high value on the present value of money mm -hmm. we place a high, high high value on that so we want we always want our money now yep everybody wants now and i'm not saying necessarily anything wrong with that except for you the buyer and you're paying like the example you show seventeen hundred dollars for a house but only eighty nine eighty five that first the first payment went to principal so think about so out of seventeen hundred that's sixteen hundred and eleven dollars that went to entrance right Okay, but that's the way our finance system in America set it up. Probably in other countries too. Uh, and that's what I'm trying to get at. What I'm trying to say is that system, no matter how you look at it, right? The system is is withdrawing from the pockets of people who are working, who mm -hmm. who you know just. All they want is to buy a nice home. They want to be able to kick the dog in the front yard, and and they also want to keep. They also want to keep the average man or woman beholding to the people that are in charge of that system to the government. For example, when Obama did that under the President Obama, when we did that uh, Rescue Act, the financial the rescue bailout. Act, yeah, there was enough money. Instead of giving it to all these banks and Wall Street people that brought this crisis on in the first place, the average American federal taxpayer could have gotten anywhere from three to four million dollars. Now you give them the money, 
most of us are going to spend it. We're going to get out of debt. We're going to pay off the auto loans. We're going to pay off the car loans. We're going to pay off our houses. Some of these people had two or three houses with $4 million. They had two or three uh, six-figure houses. That was enough to pay that off. So instead of working it so everybody could pay off their stuff and have a little lease, they did a system that they knew would keep the average man or woman beholden to the government, beholden to the finance industry, mm-hmm. beholden to the to the business folks. Because see that that way, all the businesses that claim they were losing money would have gotten paid. Right. They, they everybody would have they, would have they would have gotten bill collectors out of their pockets. They would have kept the government out of their pockets as long as the governments didn't go, now we gotta tax you on this crap. I mean, do us like you do the rich folks, and I'm not got nothing against the rich folks. But pass that taxation benefit down to us and quit making us guys in our situation carry everybody. We could have paid off our bills because, see, if I'd have got three, four million dollars at the time I was buying a house, I'd have paid that off. Oh, absolutely. I'd have, I, uh, I'm not saying I would have go buy a new car, but I'd have found me a shop that could fix my cars right that I had and got them, got them fixed so that they could have lasted. I would have had some painters and stuff come to my house. That house needed some other repairs. I'd have gotten that stuff done. That way I'm helping the economy. Because I got workers coming in, I got workers working, I'm putting in money to the but but that's not what they wanted. They wanted they want to keep you and me beholden from cradle to grave. And one way to do that is with interest. Interest mm-hmm. payments, uh payday loans with the oh. three figure with the three figure loan amounts that you gotta pay back at a States allowing annual rates up to four hundred percent, and that kind of thing. How is that uh, ridiculous? Credit cards. And what did Reagan do? The first thing he got off of? he cut out the credit card interest. He cut out all the consumer interest. The deductions. The consumer yeah. interest deductions. Right. And 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 if you look at it, the consumer household or consumer is like a business. We have income. Mm-hmm. We have outflows. Yeah, expenses. Now yeah. with this knucklehead came in and did. So for any Reagan fans, yeah, I call him a knucklehead. <laughs> he came in and took all the consumer deductions away. Uh, and by the way, all of this taking acts to everything and just, just cut without studying. Reagan came back in the second year and said he wish he hadn't have done that. He wish he would not have done that, but we still got knuckleheads in Congress still believing in that. So why why so, couldn't I why couldn't I write my stuff off my taxes? Well, okay. Um so we can go down that road. Um and 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 to me that gets into the flat tax. The mm-hmm. whole idea was the whole idea of consumer interest deductions. Right. Uh, I can say the whole idea. Part of it is uh, uh, they allowed businesses in order to um, be able to juice business in the in the country. They mm-hmm. allowed businesses to write off losses, which was um, what social or welfare for the corporations. So they are allowed just to, in general to write off their expenses. To write off expenses to amateur to amateur mm-hmm. to um, depreciate um, assets, uh, mm-hmm. you know, in order to uh, put more money into the pockets of business and business uh, even flourishes more. And supposedly, so they so flourish. I understand all of that, <laughs> and and so the you know you know interest deductions and all that kind of stuff gets into um, gets into tax policy and what what are we trying to accomplish with our tax policy 
And so I, I, I think that that's another whole podcast in and of itself. It gets us into yes, it, it is. gets us into another area. And, and so I want to yes, try not to run off into that area. But, okay. but so, the, so the concern that I have is, is that um, we, have, we have put in place a system that uh, extracts more from the middle class because middle class home ownership was a linchpin of the middle class. Home ownership is a linchpin of, of middle class. Uh, owning a home, because what else can you have? What is What other large expenditure do you have to be considered middle class? It's a home. That's it. Well, yeah, it's a house. It's a, it's a house. And so you by 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 having loans that are structured in such a way that huge amounts of income huge amounts of personal wealth are extracted from those people in the course of home ownership because even if you go to sell your house even if you go to sell your house, uh, you're not gonna get for you're not gonna get six hundred thousand for that. Nope. So if you sell your house for, um, let's say two hundred and sixty-five thousand, you bought it for two hundred thousand, you sell it for two sixty, two hundred sixty-five. Is that reasonable? Or, or do you think it, you, you're gonna sell it higher? Well, it depends on how long you've had it, how how far down. The okay, so what line. would you th- what would you think was reasonable? J- just so I could get to my next point. Well, okay, so we're looking at typically a thirty year mortgage. So are we selling it a couple years? You're selling later? it at the end of the thirty. At the end of the thirty, okay. So That's you own the house now. Time. You you're not paying a mortgage yeah. anymore. All you're paying is taxes on the house. Yeah. What's what's a I reasonable mean, What's a reasonable dollar amount to sell your house for? You know, 30 years is uh, so much can happen in 30 years that, that that's really a hard number to call. Cause, okay. So I'm mean, just going to go with, I'm going to go with your house appreciates for six seventy thousand dollars $70,000. So you bought okay. it for $200,000 at the end of 30 years, you're going to sell it for $270,000. Mm-hmm. You're going to get $270,000, so you're going to get $70,000 for your house. Okay. That person is going to have to take out a 30-year fixed loan and right. another four hundred dollars or $500,000 is going to be extracted from that transaction. Yeah. So it's just seeing how the interest passes along. Right. There's always a finance industry waiting to lend you the money Mm -hmm. with this interest price tag. Now somebody else got to pay triple the asking price for the house by the time they pay off all these interests Mm -hmm. on the thing. I mean, then you go to buy a car because most of the, well, you need transportation. Right. It's just a matter how you get it. Do you just ride a bicycle, ride a motorcycle? Uh, Get your, you know, get a vehicle, so a car or an SUV is just, uh, you know, how you do it. Then you got to pay interest on that loan. Mm -hmm. That Mm -hmm. loan, you got to interest. Because like I say, a car is a big purchase now. It takes you seven years. You know, I just see that they're taking seven years of financing to pay for cars. Mm -hmm. Oh. So now, uh, so now you've got two kids. They're going to college. Yes. So you've got a home loan. Yes. At at five at four percent. You've got student yes. loans at three percent. Uh and then yeah. you're gonna they're gonna borrow sixty, seventy thousand dollars. Well student loans are like eight percent now. Okay. So they're that eight percent and that's that's another seventy thousand dollars. And then yeah. you, you you gotta buy a vehicle. Yes. That's six years at six, four or five percent. And you want improvements to your home. 
mm-hmm. and you're probably gonna have to finance that, right? So, so how much wealth are they extracting out of the middle class mm-hmm. with interest? Well, first of all, I would say all of it, but then the other question would be what who is middle class because you know depending on where you live the economy's different uh different jobs pay different scales so for- well i'm just talking about somebody that for middle class for the most part we talking about somebody who has the work to earn their money to live okay not uh they're not receiving the assistance it, the way i've had it explained to me Mm-hmm. You're rich. You're rich when you have money working for you and you don't have to go to work for the money. Right. You're right. rich. You're, you're in the rich class when you, if you don't get that pay, if you don't get a steady paycheck, can you still live? Can you still live at close to the standard that you are at? So I, I look at middle class as somebody that has to get up. It has to go to work. If they don't go to that job, they lose. Like my prior job when I was a firefighter, I was there because I needed to be. I wasn't there because it was something I liked doing, and I felt that my life was just was just dull and boring. So hey, why don't I go be a firefighter? I needed the money. I was raising a wife and uh, three kids. I needed the money. Right, but that that scenario kind of confuses me because, <clears throat> okay, I understand that if you got the money working for you, you don't have to go out, punch a clock or whatever. You you maybe got a couple of Lamborghinis or you live in large. Yeah. Uh, working, you got to go punch a clock. You work, uh, whether it's mm-hmm. in a factory, whether it's in fast food. Right. But where where is the bottom of the the where does you where does middle class on the lower end stop? Well, there's not middle. There's not. There's not. Okay. So, so you're looking for a hard definition. Right. And, and, and there, and, and there's always gray. There's Mm -hmm. always gray because you could have rental property and your money's working for you and not be rich. Sure. sure. So, so there's no hard number. But the middle class is a um, it's just a societal range where you're not you're not struggling and using and necessarily having a lot of assistance and mm-hmm. you're not so self independent that you don't have to work that that's somewhere okay. in where middle class is so I always thought it was uh, a lot more uh, a little more defined than that because you can take somebody that's just barely scraping by, maybe a couple of people working in fast food restaurants, but they can pay the bills. They they manage to stay off welfare. You would still say they're middle class. Yes, you you could. There's there's an argument to be made. There is no there as far as I know, there is no okay. hard and fast definition. And when I say hard and fast, there is not. You can't apply okay. a standard across every situation Mm -hmm. that's going to make it middle class. So So middle class is a generalization. It's a generalization Mm -hmm. that the majority of the people function in that area and are capable of sustaining themselves. Okay. So I I don't know um, how else to... Right. That's pretty much... It's pretty broad. I just say it. Say that. Sure, it's broad. Yeah. It's broad. You know, the, not everything. So, 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 you know, what I can say there is, um, when we talk about middle class, we're, we're talking about um, usually uh, blue collar workers, some white collar workers, mm-hmm. um, people that punch time clocks versus in, and you know, maybe in the low end of management. Um, I don't know if you could you would consider a a company CEO as middle class, but at which point in the corporate 
in the corporate ladder does middle class stock. Mm -hmm. so, so there's no there's no hard and fast rule as far as I know. And so it's, okay. a, it's a generalization that you that you have to use at least and to have a conversation. Because if, if, if we spent most of the time defining middle class, we would never get to uh, talk about how the middle class is impacted by policies. But don't you have to have an idea of who they are to- Well, we do uh, have an idea. That's, that's what I'm saying. We have an idea. We don't have- It's a broad uh, idea. We don't have a yeah. hard line that we can kick anybody out of middle class or, or, you know, or say that they're not middle class, but we do have some idea what rich is. Because mm -hmm. you, you mentioned two Lamborghinis. Why did you, why did, uh, middle class people can own a Lamborghini. That no, doesn't I mean, never, that I doesn't mean that they can necessarily pay for it. it. Like, I never really looked at it like that. Right. Well, it was a point that you brought up earlier. It depends on the region. Mm -hmm. uh, a few years ago, I had a day off job from the fire department. I worked for AutoZone. Okay. I worked at AutoZone. Mm -hmm. My boss at AutoZone had graduation, graduated with a degree in uh, uh, mechan mecha electromechanics, electrical, mechanical engineer. Mm hmm he went out to California on some job interviews. They only wanted to start paying them twenty eight grand a year. In St. Louis, a Missouri area, you could make it at that time off twenty eight grand a year. Oh yeah, but you couldn't well, do it in California, where for a studio apartment at mm -hmm. that time, we talking about nineteen ninety six, ninety seven. Right. You were paying fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars a month for a studio. Okay, and you could still get a two bedroom here in St. Louis, Missouri, for about at that time for about six, seven hundred dollars a month. Mm -hmm. So twenty eight thousand didn't go as far out there as it went here. No so way. he would have had to automatically get a second job. Right. And the company would have worked the stew out of him. And only gave twenty eight dollars, uh, twenty eight thousand a year. So, but you know, they they design these policies, the middle class and the low class, what they consider high class. Mm -hmm. The government had definitions for them with the poverty index. They tried okay. to quantify it where, if you got a family of four, mama, dad, two kids, right, and only this much income is coming at coming in. You at the poverty level, you below it, you above it, and they got a different, a whole scale for that, depending on how many people mm -hmm. are trying to get on that income. Okay, me with my wife and two kids, mm -hmm. and sixty-five thousand coming into the house would be considered high class here, but for a mom and dad out of San Francisco. Totally different. With two kids and sixty, you know, it ain't coming. Yeah, and they totally. still got to pay the high interest costs and stuff, like yeah. I do. So it eats up more than money. I, oh, yeah. I, I visited San Francisco once, and uh, to park a car in the garage of the hotel we were staying in, you had to pay seventeen dollars a day. Mm -hmm. Seventeen. <laughs> Alrighty, so. We're gonna move on. <laughs> We've already passed up our a lot of time for this discussion today. <laughs> oh my goodness! We um, haven't even come close to uh, not, figuring out an solving anything. Right? Crazy. We didn't even talk about J just just identifying the problem requires so much energy yes. that coming at, coming up with a solution has got to be astronomical. And I agree. And yeah. so we, we're going to leave that for, you know, coming up with a solution. But That's a whole nother, a whole that's nother a whole ball of wax. <laughs> right. So all I wanted to do was, you know, bring some recognition to um, how much wealth is being sucked out of people mm -hmm. in, in, a, in a system 
that creates winners and losers. And so, and so what I hope is that we change our system so that everybody wins Mm -hmm. so that you can get a home loan and not pay three times and, and most of it go to interest and that, and that at the end of it, um, you're not having to buy a reverse mortgage just to stay in your home. Right. You know what I'm saying? You've worked all your life. Mm-hmm. You did all of the right things to buy your home. And now because you don't have an income anymore, now you're on life on financial life support. Right. And that's and that's I think that's wrong to treat people that way. But but it takes more than just me thinking that that's a bad idea. Mm-hmm. Right. And so and so hopefully by examining what the system is really like, we can start to try to um, hash out some alternatives mm-hmm. so that so that the system becomes fairer. So now I'm going <clears> to, <throat> I'm going to really put us in a, this, so <laughs> this, being Leonard's laugh about ready to, Warren's smiling. <laughs> so, so I, I, I got a video and, um, it lit a fire under me. <laughs> so I'm going to show you the video and then, and then I'm guaranteeing you, we probably won't be able to get out of this conversation <laughs> in 10 minutes. <laughs> Okay. On July 4th, we're boycotting all business. This financial freeze is a demonstration everyone can participate in. Please don't spend any money in America online or in store. No all stock right, purchase or trade. Pay your bills, get your grocery and your gas early. If you have to work those days, please pack your lunch. This month on June 19th, we will be commemorating Black Independence Day by supporting Black On July 4th, we're boycotting all business. This financial freeze is a demonstration everyone can participate in. Please don't spend any money in America online or in store. No stock purchase or trade. Pay your bills, get your grocery and your gas early. If you have to work those days, please pack your lunch. This month on June 19th, we will be commemorating Black Independence Day by supporting Black-owned businesses. Quick history. June 19th, known as Juneteenth, is a celebration of the end of slavery. There are still four states in America that refuse to acknowledge it as a national holiday. Please stand in solidarity with the Black community and don't spend any money this 4th of July through the 7th of July. But do invest in Black economics on June 19th. Please help us honor our ancestors in a nation they built. Okay. Uh, Either one of you guys want to go first? You want me to go first? Yeah, go you ahead. Can... Lead it on. All right. Yep. <laughs> this was this was one of the most irresponsible acts um, I have seen in a while. When the economy was healthy, there was the idea of flexing black economic muscle mm-hmm. by having a day where we don't buy anything so that the economy, so that people see in real terms, the power Mm -hmm. of black economics. Okay. The problem that we have is the economy is not healthy. It is sick. Let me, let me uh, bring up some, some, uh, newspaper articles about what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, There was this article, um, which was from Black Enterprise. So from, from Black Enterprise, in the article, and I think, you know, if you find the podcast, on um, on YouTube, 
Uh, I put the links in the description. And if you find the audio podcast on um, any of the platforms that I have put the podcast on, you, you should be able to see the links. But in this article, it states that in March, analysts were reporting that the coronavirus pandemic would hit African-Americans and Latinos harder than any other race. Those predictions have become fact. Our economy is on life support now, says Erica Goshen, a former commissioner for the Labor, of Depar- uh, for the, uh, Labor Department's Bureau of Labor Statistics. In an uh, interview, she told Reuters. As far as, and, and this, this article was from the uh, Economic Policy Institute. Evidence to date suggests that black and Hispanic workers face much more academic, ec- economic and health insecurity from COVID-19 than white workers. And while unemployment skyrocketed for black and white workers in the COVID-19 labor market, the unemployment rate for uh, blacks is higher. This article from Forbes. Congress, the title of the uh, title of the article, Congress needs to act before half of the U.S.'s black and Latinx owned small businesses close. Mm-hmm. NBC News, and this this will be the last one. I won't bore you with a ton of them, but they're 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 out there all over the place, and and that's part of why I had such an issue with this video. Um, NBC News, despite good intentions, the government's emergency relief program leaves many feeling left behind. A lot of black businesses didn't get the financial uh, support from the COVID-19 relief bill. And so... This person, this young lady, while she may mean well, flexing our economic muscle at this time, I think it's going to hurt black people and minorities more than it's going to be impacted by um, the, the intent of having a boycott. So in other words, you can we could do more damage. And if you notice, it wasn't one day. Mm-hmm. They wanted four days of economic suppression in a down market where it's quite possible the untold destruction that that could cause. It may hurt their intended target, but it may have devastating effects on unintended victims. And what I think is, is that we have to heal the wounds that people have caused us so that we don't bleed on people that didn't hurt us. This economic boycott is not targeted at a specific group for a specific reason. It's random and it's not targeted. It's just blanket. There are a lot of my, uh, there are a lot of white-owned businesses that support the black community, and this hurts them too. And it, it, there is no, there is no, there is no statement of what which the the Montgomery bus boycotts was specific mm-hmm. to the transportation industry. Mm -hmm. It was intended to have a specific result to bring about specific change. 
And when you do that, then you can measure your results. A boycott like she's talking about is arbitrary. You can't measure the results and you have no you have made no demands for people to even appease you. Okay, I see your point there. I can definitely see that point. Well, I mean, I, it was interesting that you brought up the Montgomery Boys boycott. Uh, would our people be disciplined enough to keep it up for four years like the Mon Montgomery Bus boycott was kept up for four years? It almost bankrupted the Montgomery bus system, so they gave in. They found out that ha at least half their ridership was black. And you mistreated them, and, and you paid for it. Uh, like she said, for three or four days, I think you concentrate on letting people know the black businesses in your community that are still going and urge support for them because a lot of these black businesses that close are done. Over half of them are going to be done forever. And they had to get through this COVID-19 crap. They had to get through now these criminals that got in with the protesters burning, looting, and robbing. And so the ones that survived, most of them will have been through a lot. So I think you have a movement with finding out who the businesses are that are still left in each of the communities across the country mm -hmm. and urging the people of those communities to support it. I think that would have been a better message than calling for a boycott. But that's just my personal opinion. Yeah, uh, she did uh, mention supporting black businesses uh, on what was what on the holiday was that was that the message that she did was I, on june night on juneteenth she was saying on juneteenth support black business right. on juneteenth right but that so, but she wanted she wanted complete blank out of the mm -hmm. general economy from july the 4th through july the 7th that's four days right right and so well go ahead Personally, I think that for four days, that's too long to even for most people to sustain. I really, even though I think she had an, a, a message she was trying to get out, I think it probably would have been easier to say one day or two day to even get people to do it, you know, without, without even knowing the effects. So four days is long. So, and, and, and I think timing is extremely crucial um, with an economy that's struggling as it is. We don't know what kind of damage has been done to our economy. Mm -hmm. We're not through the COVID-19 mess now. We don't know what the long-term ramifications are. And so something of this nature at this particular time, I think is irresponsible because you have to know what, what impact you're trying to have and you have to target it to the people you're trying to hurt or that you're trying to get their attention. Mm -hmm. And just doing a general across the board means that you're hurting a lot of people who didn't do anything wrong. Okay. That's my, that's my take on it. And then I've got one more point, which uh, I'm ready to take heat for. <laughs> um, we have an opportunity to do what the majority didn't do. We have an opportunity to put forth 
our idea of a community that is inclusive, that benefits everyone, that serves everyone. My saying is you cannot destroy the monster by becoming the monster. So to say only support black businesses, we would have a conniption fit if white people said only support white businesses. But if we take economic sanctions like we're talking about, like she's talking about, where you only support black businesses, don't white businesses and white people have the same responsibility to, to their economic well-being? If we don't want to be treated that way, we cannot treat others that way. No matter how angry we are, no matter what problems we've experienced, our community has been devastated by, by the lack of support. But to turn around and do that to someone else is never going to be right. So how do you think uh, we black businesses turn around and get that support? What do they need to do? We need to make sure that we're supporting businesses that support the ideas that we believe in. If we believe that everybody is, is special, that everybody should be treated specially, uh, you know, equally, then we have to make sure that we're treating people equally. Yes, you support black businesses, but you also support um, other businesses, Asian businesses, Native American businesses that support your community. Well, I understand that, but I, I, I'm i looking for, I'm trying to figure out what the examples are. Where is this happening? No, I'm saying that's oh. what we should be doing. Instead of calling for only supporting black businesses, we should call mm -hmm. for supporting businesses that support us. Right. And I'm looking for the examples of those businesses that support us. I'm saying where is. Oh, the, so you're saying that you don't believe the that there's any non-black businesses that support the black community. I'm not saying that. I'm asking the question, where are the examples? Um, because okay. So well, hair, uh, hair care, uh, Asian hair care companies, um, mm -hmm. Asian, Asian, um, or um, Muslim, uh, not Muslim, um, Arab businesses mm -hmm. or in the black neighborhood. We may disagree Absolutely. on a few things, but they are here in, in the black neighborhoods, mm -hmm. you know, and, and they're, a lot of them are doing the best that they can. And, and they may not be getting, they may be getting or not getting the support that they need to be able to stay in those neighborhoods. So the businesses are there. There are, well, there are non-black businesses that support sure. the black community. And we should be supporting those businesses. Well, a lot of people would argue that it's not a business of support, but it's a business of extraction where these non-blacks come in, they, they open up shop. Yeah, they provide uh, a store, you know, an opportunity for you to come in and purchase, give them your money, but are they really supporting the community in an at-large way? Do they really put anything back into that community, I think, is, is the issue that most Blacks have with those non-Black businesses. Is so what about they just the Black businesses that uh, they have, an off, they have a, a storefront in the Black community, but they don't mm -hmm. live in the Black community? They don't give to, you know, they don't support other... You know, what other support do you expect a business to, to give to the black community to be considered um, worthy of your support? Okay, well, first of all, I think we need to look at just besides taking 
money out of the community, which is that's what the business is there for to to provide the goods know, and services. Goods and services, but. So many times you, when you talk to people about these businesses that they have to deal with, there's there's literally blatant disrespect for those people in that community. I mean, you have uh, employees and they're assaulting uh, customers. Uh, and black businesses you know, don't do that? I, I don't hear about it. I'm not saying oh, they don't. Okay. You know, okay. I'm not saying they don't, but I, I, I think I'm... There's a very bad image of uh, these, especially foreigners in black neighborhoods and how so, they treat. So a foreigner comes to this, um, uh, um, a foreigner comes to this country. Mm -hmm. They're given preferential treatment because they're not black. And I think this is the situation. Tell me if I'm wrong. I think this is the situation you're alluding to. They come to this country. They're given a loan. They're given an opportunity to open a business in a black mm -hmm. neighborhood, which they're probably not given an opportunity to open a business in a white neighborhood. Because now who's stopping that? The white people. Okay, so so okay, so I want to I want to stick to the point first, and then okay. and then we can go back and talk about the ancillary um, okay. issues. So they come, they open up a business. Whereas a, a black person was, was not given a loan to open up a business in the black community or mm -hmm. was not allowed banking privileges that would allow them to operate a business in a black community. So, so this other group comes in, opens the business. They have different, they have differing um, social, uh, um, what's the term I'm looking for? Um, social mediums for their society. So uh, how they how they treat media. each other in their society um, mm -hmm. is different, mm -hmm. and they bring that with them. Mm -hmm. and, so you're saying and they and treat us like they treat each other. They sh they treat us like they treat each other. Okay, okay. I I don't know that to be the truth, but you know I I can't say because I don't hang out with them. Okay, so then, so then, what are you basing the fact on that they're treating um, their black patrons unfairly? Well, I I, I just don't uh, know that they uh, disrespect one another the way black people claim that they respect disrespect them. Now, I could be wrong, but you know, I, I just don't see it. Okay, that that's well, well what just getting say? around and seeing things. It's just you have blacks that know how to go into places and act respectable toward people. You have people that taking their liberties of disrespecting black folks. Uh, it's a matter of the two people of our, or the two people of our people of class, or the two people of our skanky people, for lack of a better term. Uh, you going in a man or woman's place to steal. Yeah. You going in as a customer, paying customer, to pay your money to get your goods or service. Uh is that's what the, that's what it is a matter of. Okay. Now I believe I'm a person that believe it was too many times that us blacks were consumers and not producers. Why can't three or four of us pull our resources together and buy enough hair care product to sell to white people instead of selling one can of spray for twelve dollars. I mean you you went in some black stores, the prices were astronomical. You're well, not gonna get that, rich that, on each sale. You gotta make sales over time. Yeah to, I understand to get that. rich. Uh uh that hair care industry though that's that's a whole that's a even different conversation because like I said they have made documentaries on how those Asians have monopolized that market and deliberately forced blacks out of it you know price fixing and uh, on a high level you know it's it's just blacks have well, a really the, the hard thing time. Is, what we're what we were less willing to do is African-American food we're mm -hmm. less willing to pull 
get five or six of us in a place where we all go in and, and, and get this business and work in. You always got somebody who's more than likely trying to get high, trying to get drunk, pulling resources out that should be left for the business, doing something crazy. I see what they're going to do, they're going to pull, their societies, they're going to pull and work together till they get you and me out. Then they compete, but you notice Whoever the race, whoever the race, whoever the race of the people are, they got the three or four businesses in the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. After they bring you out, I mean, there are just times I may have a business idea. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to be able to pull it out by myself, so I come and get you. I come and get Leon. We might, the three of us, get decided that we might have to have a couple more people involved. Let's do this. Let's work it. Let's divide our labor and, and let's go with it. I know Leon's expertise is with media production and IT. Right. That's what he's done for what, over 20 some years now? Over there, almost 30. Okay. So if I got a business, I'm starting a business, it's going to have a component of IT. Of broadcasting, I'd be a fool not to go to Leon. Right. Uh, like I checked with you on on some things recently on on, on what I want to do. Mm-hmm. You know, I talked to Leon. Leon said, "Hey, let's talk to Warren because Warren did this." Right. I would be foolish to not at least, hey Warren, you know, what's up with this? What's up with that? You know, it's it's we have to we gotta learn and do cooperative. When a man told me one time it was cooperative economics. Right. Other, yep. other societies have got that idea and gained it. Mm-hmm. And I'm and I'm speaking to you as an African American. We right. can we, we seem to keep hitting and bumping heads on that idea. You know, uh, a business is business. We can't we can't come in there high and drunk. Right, and stumbling right. over people and talking to people in the kind of way. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. How can I help you, ma'am? We mm. gotta provide, we gotta learn how to provide some customer service. Well, yeah, absolutely. Business is business. Business is business. Like one time, I called to order a pizza from a restaurant. I said mm. the cheeseburger pizza, and I could tell it was one of those young, young black men. Oh no, we ain't got no cheeseburger pizza. Here. You don't say that to a customer over the phone. Probably tooted right. up, tattooed and all crazy. Mm. And that's not the same thing against tattoos, but I would have handled that. Okay, sir, you want he tell me you want a cheeseburger. So you want a uh pizza with hamburger cheese? Do you want onions? Because that's a a big thing people will have on a pizza. That you know, and you say it in what you have. Right, right. Okay, like my first formal job is 16. I worked at the St. Louis Zoo. Okay. Uh, our boss told us my first day there at work, your customer is always right. Even when they're wrong. True. They're right. Uh, That's called I the golden rule. The straw. You know, all of that stuff. So you, so you learn to say, yes, ma'am, yes, sir. How mm-hmm. can I help? Can I help you? Can I get something else for you? My first manager I worked at AutoZone for, he was the same way. You don't yeah. let a customer come in the door and look and just look at him or not address him. Yes, sir. What can I help you get today? Absolutely. Yeah. Simple. Simple. Yeah. Some of those basic manners, you know, really need to start in the home, you know, before we get a certain age. Cause but, but what do you do when they don't learn them at home? then you might want to reconsider another employee. <laughs> yeah, but, but we've got, that means we've got a lot of young people who can't get a job because rather than walk up to a customer and have their hat on straight and, and their belt tightened and say, how may I help you today? And smile doing it. Mm-hmm. How, how many times, when was the last time you walked into some place? And mm-hmm. the person walked up to you, hi, how are you today? What can I get you? 
Um, so we're, we're running a special today on X, Y, and Z. Uh, I think it would be a great addition to your order. Mm -hmm. When was the last time you did that? You had that happen to you. Most well, of the that time, was rare. <laughs> I'm sorry, most of the time, um, I have to go, uh, excuse me, can you give me some napkins? I'd like some ketchup. Right. You know, if I'm ordering French fries, offer me some freaking ketchup. <laughs> Allow me to tell you I don't want ketchup. But do what you can to make my meal the best it could possibly be. Right. If so I isn't want, that a matter of training? But you said it's part, I agree with you. It is a part of home training. It is a part of management's responsibility. And so yeah, we have a failure of management too. Yeah. On both ends. On both ends. All three mm -hmm. ends. Because the individual Absolutely doesn't get a bypass yeah. when they know that they should be doing it and don't do it. Right. And the management and the management when it comes to working situation, whether or not I've had the home training the management, when you're teaching them how to do the job, such as you're teaching them how to work the grill, you're teaching them how to cash register, mm -hmm. you're telling them they gotta clean, you're teaching them also public service. This is how we do it. Mm -hmm. So it 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 comes, it comes with. Uh, I had to, I learned that dealing with the public is a beast of a different kind. And okay. you have to yeah. you have to do the best you can as far as being available, providing service and do that. And mm -hmm. just like Leon's thing, when I go when we go to a restaurant and that person gave us good service, we tip and we tip generously. Sure. Sure. And I walk out and I don't have no problem with that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, when the person gives me service, that's how I show my appreciation of your service. So I how often do you feel you get service on that good level that you just described? I believe I've gotten it over the last, let's say six, seven years. I've gotten it more on that good level than on that bad level. Yeah. Okay. I've gotten them more, but but I've had the cases like I just told you, you know, just told you about when I called the, the hamburger. Pizza, this guy, going, you know, I said the cheeseburger pizza. Yeah, I got the restaurant chains confused, but wow. the way you handle that is okay. Okay, sir, you want a hamburger? You want a pizza with hamburger and cheese? Now I'll be kept pressing that issue. I say, well, sorry, sir, we don't have. Cheese, we don't have a, a, a menu item called a cheeseburger item. Mm -hmm. But I can give you a pizza with these specific items. Instead okay. of telling I'm you sitting here and tell you and get no attitude with you what we of, don't have. You right. know, huh? No, go ahead. Right. Instead of instead and, of telling and, you what we don't have, I'm gonna find a way to get you what you want. Exactly. As a customer service person. You're there to serve a need, solve a problem. Because mm -hmm. in AutoZone, when I was working, he didn't come in, or she did come in to me because life was just going smooth and nothing was wrong with their car. They weren't having trouble storing their car or something. So within my limits, I tried to help them find what they need. Now, I've mm -hmm. had customers come in and say, no, 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 go get Gerald. He was a guy. That been there for 13, 14 years. Mm -hmm. Used to work on cars. He he knew. I, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, right. Yes, yes, I'm, yes, I'm going to get Gerald. Yes, sir. Let me go get Gerald. Let me go get Gerald. Yeah. Of course. I go get Gerald, and I ain't got to, I ain't got to deal with that person particularly anymore. But I ain't got I an go attitude either. Huh? I don't have an attitude either, because they asked I, me to go I get Gerald. I'm glad to go he get Gerald. Yeah, he said, oh, son, you, you don't know what I need. Go get your... Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's what I said. Yes, see. sir. I said, yes, sir. Hey, Gerald, well, is come it, up here, man. Is, is there anything come. else I can get you while Gerald is helping you? <laughs> is there anything else I can get That's you? It. <laughs> you? That's you, it. You need, a, you need a hammer? I can get you a hammer. And Gerald can <laughs> help you on your car. Yeah. Why do I have an attitude? 
Right. I, I'm getting a paycheck to make sure you find everything that you need so that you keep coming back here so that I keep getting a paycheck. Exactly. Exactly. That should be the way they look at it. Well, we just told them. So ain't no excuses. <laughs> and you got an employee that you got an employee that refused to do it. I like your other suggestion. You have to consider a different employee. Hey, or, you know, or you have to consider a first the first thing. Um, you have to because I, I was a manager. Mm-hmm. So I I say that um, not because I'm patting myself on the back, but because I understand the responsibility of management. Mm-hmm. Yes. If I've got an employee that's that's not taking care of the customer the way that they should, the problem isn't with the employee. Mm-hmm. The problem is with the manager. Because you're supposed to hire the people, you're supposed yeah. to train the people, and you're supposed to follow up with your people to make sure they're doing their training. Yes. And if they're yeah. not, you don't blame the person. My employees, oh, he's, I, I got to fire him. Every employee that you had to fire is, is your failure, not the employee's. It's the responsibility of the manager to give the employee everything that they need to be successful. And when an employee fails, it is not on the employee. It is on the manager. I'm not in a hundred percent agreement with that. No, I was going to say, being, well, hold on a second. A hold, hold on a second. Cause I think your mic just went out. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, being, I think your mic just super, went out. After, after being a supervisor myself, <laughs> no, if you give them the direction and you did all the things you mentioned and they still acting, if you have that authority to fire, you fire. Like a I didn't say you didn't with, fire. You right. do. But it was your failure. Well, I mean that's not something I disagree <laughs> with a hundred percent, but okay, I understand. I mean, you know, you I have, disagree. I just think it's by taking the responsibility upon myself, I'm never looking for a way out. I'm always looking to push myself to be better. And I that's what's that. most important to me. And there's certain people that will only go up to a level and and no matter what you do, you can't push them over. They're that. not going to get past. And that's not you. That's them. Like one time I had made it up to captain on on my on a fire department. All right. And the guy was bagging the truck in and something happened. And there was a captain on another shift that made a big deal out of it. So I had to go down and have a hearing because he and I were having personal conflict anyway. That's okay. And I told the guy, I told my driver, you were following my orders. You were following my direction. Mm -hmm. This ain't going to be on you. I take this hit. That's what I get paid for is your supervisor. I take that hit. And I told him the first day, as long as you follow in my order and you're within the standard operating procedure and the rules and regulations of the fire department, then it's my hit to take. Mm. And when that happens, I went down and my chief was the deputy chief that was uh, uh, in charge of my hearing Mm-hmm. was waiting for me to argue. I said, no, chief, I did that wrong. According to this rule, that rule, and this rule, I was wrong. And he he stopped because he didn't know what to do for a minute. He said, okay, Davis, you lose four hours of pay. All right. It was done in less than 10 minutes, that hearing. That hearing was done in less than 10 minutes. So, yeah, so Leon, like you say, it, it was management for he was doing everything I told him to do. Something happened, and there were some notifications I was supposed to make that I didn't make. Hmm. Okay. So I just told him, you ain't got to worry about this. I take this hit. This is on me. And so I lost four hours of pay behind that, but I started covering my backside because <laughs> I knew that other SOB of a captain wasn't no good. When you, know, you take responsibility, when you take responsibility, 
then you'll do you become a better person. I'm right. a better person for yeah, it. Yeah, a better person for it. Knowing I had knowing I had a snake on my back. I said, yeah, okay, but, this is but the I minute you blame this. the minute you blame someone else, the minute you blame the employee, the minute you blame the system, the minute you blame mm. upper management, you're not bettering yourself. And that's that's right. all I'm saying. Okay. All right. So you, right. We, we're about to ready to wrap up since we done went off into uh, <laughs> attacking folks and hamburgers and pizzas and <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm ready for, I'm ready for uh, cheeseburger pizza now. I'm ready for cheeseburger done. pizza too. <laughs> I want to thank you, gentlemen. We I've had a a, a great discussion this evening, um, and sure. I, I, I really like doing what we do. So we'll be back next week. Supposedly this week we were going to have. Uh, Kim Ferguson on, and she was going to talk about dealing with stress. Um, we had to move okay. that to next week. Okay. So um, hopefully everything will work out. We will have her on okay. next Saturday. All right. I I'm talking to the audience. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess I'm talking to you too, but I thought I told we're you. We're taking notes. But we're taking, we're taking notes. notes. Uh, and so and so we will be back next Saturday. I want to uh, thank everybody for tuning in. We went uh, an hour and a half today. And, and the only reason I make note of that is, um, it, to me, it's, it's more wow. important that we get to um, get the information out there, um, take a look at things, and provide information that helps um, all of us make better decisions rather than just sticking to a standard um, you know, 30 minute format. So I apologize for anyone that was anticipating 30 minutes and uh, being able to move on. Um, but uh, in the future, and I'll make modifications to um, my business plan, um, but we will um, have the discussion as best we can to, to at least make sure we uh, all at least get an opportunity to um, get our points out there and, you know, provide information that I think is going to be helpful. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good job, guys. Good job. Good job. See y'all later. That concludes this episode and thank you for listening. This podcast is designed for live listener <laughs> interaction. Visit the website, the lion's den stl.wixsite.com slash home for details about how to join the conversation. The video version of Altitude Adjustment is available on YouTube. Search for Lion's Den STL. And the audio podcast is available on Stitcher.com, Anchor.fm, the iTunes Store, and the Google Play Music Store, to name a few. Look for Altitude Adjustment where you get your podcast and consider making a contribution by visiting Anchor.fm slash Altitude Adjustment 2. Remember, the internet is powered by your likes, shares, and comments. So please like, share, and comment on this and other episodes because it matters. As always, be cool, be calm, and above all, be careful. Look out for the other guy because they may not be looking out for you. <laughs>